much for uh, joining us today, uh, despite a storm in California. Uh, you know, uh, I would just like to start by quoting what my professor who says, if somebody like Professor Damodaran is there on stage, it's not him, but I who need an introduction. So being a resilient founder myself in the past, I would still go ahead and give it a try uh, with a very small brief introduction that I've written for you. So Professor Damodaran, often referred to as the Dean of Valuation, is a prominent figure in the world of finance and academia. He is a finance professor at the Stern School of Business in the New York University, where he has gained widespread recognition for his expertise in valuation, corporate finance, and investment management. Known for his engaging teaching style, Professor Damodaran has authored several books uh, on valuation and finance, and he's also a respected speaker. So without further delay, Professor, uh, I hand it over to you to kickstart the session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a favor, if I can. Um, sure. For those of you who have your cameras turned off, could you, if you could turn them on, assuming you're dressed. I mean, don't do it if you're, if it's late at night, I understand. But even in your pajamas, I really don't care. If you turn your cameras on, it'll make my life easier because I'd rather speak to faces than to gray boxes. No. So welcome. I mean, I, I, I hope you're not looking for some massive insights in this session where you come and saying, I don't know how to value a startup and he's going to tell me how to do it because you're not going to get that. In a, in a sense, I'm going to make you revisit basics and I'm going to treat this like a regular classroom. I'm going to call on you and, and if you feel uncomfortable, just pass, pass on the baton. I'm not doing it to make you uncomfortable or to put you on the spot, but to make this more like a regular class. Yeah. So when I was uh, asked about the topics and we decided on this one, valuing startups, I, I decided to go back to basics because I'm one of those strange people who actually likes to value young companies. You know? Let's step back. You know? I know you come, many of you come off a corporate finance exam. Is valuation part of your corporate finance class? Arushi? I'm going to call in individual people. Otherwise, every, is value, is, are you in the corporate finance class? Um, so, Arushi, can I put you on the spot? It's, uh, is valuation part of your corporate finance class? Yes. Or, okay. So, tell me, I mean, I, without putting you on the spot, what do you think the value of a business is? What does it mean when you value a business? What are you trying to do? Um, to understand how much cash flows it can generate uh, in, over the next few the years. Or in the future? In the future, in the future. Valuation is first all about the future. It's not yeah. about the past, right? Yeah. But where do you get all the information to make your predictions for the future? Um, so for a startup, probably you look at comparable. No, no, for any company, let's okay. get startups aside. For any company, right. where would you, so if I asked you to value ITC, where would you start to get the data to project the future? The financial reports, the existing financial reports. You'd look at the past, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And so having a lot of past <laughs> data, does it help you? Yeah, because yeah. it gives you a sense of what a company is growing at, what its margins are. It's not that the past is you is is by itself used in valuation, but it helps you make predictions for the future, right? But ultimately, it's all about the future. And ultimately, when you think about what drives the value mm -hmm. of a company, it's the answers to four basic questions. You can mute yourself, Arush, if you want. No. Um, Naveen, you're not muted if you could mute yourself because if you otherwise we get feedback. So if you're not muted, make sure you're muted. And when I call on you, unmute yourself. So when you sit down to value a company, I know we think about discounted cash flow models and Excel spreadsheet, but if you step back and think about what you're trying to do in valuation, you're trying to answer four basic questions. Four basic questions, no matter what the kind of what company you're looking at. First is you're asking, what is the value of the investments I've already made as a company? We call these assets in place, right? The second is, what is the value that's going to be added or destroyed by future growth? Notice how I phrase the question. I don't ask you what future growth is, because growth by itself is neither good nor bad. Though much as you, you know, you would read what CNBC or read equity research reports, growth is always treated as is unalloyed good, but growth is a trade-off, right? The good side of growth is it makes your revenues and your earnings grow, make them larger over time. What's the bad side of growth, Pratik? What 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 what's the trade-off on growth? Oh uh, maybe I mean, you know. Uh, you will incur certain losses. 
when you grow that's, drastically. That's, that's output. You're looking at the wrong thing to for a manufacturing company to grow. What does it have to do? You got factories, right? Uh, it has to. It has to invest a huge, you know, huge. It's lot got of to money build. Let's assets. not even put in any value judgments. Huge, not huge. You got to build more factories. If you're a technology Correct. company, assets. you've got to, have, you know, spend money on R and D, do acquisitions. Right. Growth is a trade-off because the good side of growth is it makes your revenues and earnings grow. The bad side is you got to invest to create that growth. Let me ask you a question. Could the bad side outweigh the good side sometimes? Absolutely, right? It's Mathematically, it's there's no reason why the first always has to exceed the second. You say, but that's not going to happen. I don't know whether any of you read my blog, but at the start of every year, I go through a very perverse exercise. Ask a simple question. Across all publicly traded companies, the world, what percentage are creating value from growth and what percentage are destroying value from growth? Because you can destroy value from growth if you have to reinvest huge amounts to get very little growth. I look at every publicly traded company, 47,000 publicly traded companies around the world. You know what percentage of companies actually destroy value as they grow? 60% of companies. So the next time you get really excited about a CEO talking about growth, stop and ask the question, is this company can growth destroy or add value? That's a value of growth. Where does it show up? It shows up in two places in your valuation. It shows up as a growth rate that you use. That's a good side. And then it shows up as a reinvestment you need to set aside. CapEx, working capital, factories, R&D, whatever you decide to put in that mix, that drives the value of growth. So, so far, value of assets in place, things you've already done, value of future growth. There's a third ingredient, which is you'd rather have predictable safe cash flows than uncertain yeah. cash flows. Everybody agree with that proposition? You don't need to bring a CAPM arbitrage pricing model. This is common sense. Would you? So if I gave you two, two sets of cash flows that are exactly identical, but one set is predictable and stable and the other set is unpredictable, you're going to value the first set higher than the second one. Anybody disagree with that notion? Because we do, we need to get that out of the way. Predictable cash flows have higher value. How do we bring that into evaluation? In a discounted cash flow valuation, there's only one place you can bring it in, is through the discount rate. The discount rate is the only vehicle in your valuation to bring in risk. And you bring in the risks of being in a risky country, a risky business, risky man, whatever it is that you're worried about risk shows up in your discount rate. So you've got cash, the cash flows from existing assets, the value of future growth, you've got the risk in those cash flows, and then you have to apply closure. Let's talk about why. The value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows on that asset over its lifetime. So you have a 10-year asset in capital budgeting. What do you do? You project out cash flows in the next 10 years. At the end of the 10th year, you salvage. You get whatever you can. Sell whatever you can on eBay, maybe. That becomes a salvage value, right? That's how we do capital budgeting. For to value a company, though, remember it's a portfolio of projects which can recreate themselves. And at least in theory, what's the life of a publicly traded company? When you look at a corporate charter, it tells you when the company was founded. When does it? say the company is going to be wound up or oh, it doesn't. In theory, what can happen? A company can go on and on and on forever. I know most companies don't, but they could, right? In which case, what do you have to do? You have to estimate cash flows forever. Who wants to do that? That's my vision of hell. So what do you do? You say, can I stop now? How about right now? I'll tell you when you can stop. I'm not going to like my answer. You can stop when you're willing to make an assumption. You know what the assumption you need to make is? Beyond that point in time, your cash flows will grow at a constant rate forever. What does it buy you? It buys you an infinite series in mathematics. Your growth rate is constant. Your discount rate is constant. 200 years ago, mathematicians solved for the value of that infinite series. You know what we did in finance? We stole that equation from mathematics. We act like we invented this, but this is that famous terminal value equation you see in every discounted cash flow valuation. It captures the present value of expected cash flows 
in perpetuity. In fact, let me take a pause there. Does it have to be a perpetuity? Now valued a Ramco at the time of its IPO four years ago. I didn't use a perpetuity. You know why not? Kush, what is Aramco's core business? What does it get its value from? Uh, Sorry, it's 330 million barrels of oil under the ground, right? That's it. Do you know why I didn't use a perpetuity? Once the oil runs out, what's left of the company? Sand in the Saudi Arabian desert. Would you? I mean, I, I don't think anybody's paying for that. So this notion of a perpetuity is something we use for convenience, but it doesn't have to be so. When I value fossil fuel companies or tobacco companies, I'm willing to use either a negative growth rate in perpetuity. You know what that means, right? Your company peaks in year 10 and then it shrinks over time. When was the last time you saw a discounted cash flow valuation where you saw a minus 5% growth rate after your time? But you should see that, right? With companies and businesses that are shrinking. Those are the drive, th those are the questions you're trying to answer in value. And I'll make a confession. I think we've lost our way in valuation. You know why we've lost our way? Because we have far more data than we used to and our tools have become more powerful. Let me repeat that again. This is going to sound incredibly contradictory. We've lost our way in valuation because we have so much more data and our tools are more powerful. We don't value companies anymore. We do financial models. Investment banking valuations are not valuations. They're spreadsheets where you feed in inputs and something comes out. So what I'd like you to do, and if this is the only thing you take out of this class is use your spreadsheets, take advantage of the data, but remember to step back and remember, remember you're valuing a company. You're not just running an Excel spreadsheet. My advice to people is to keep it simple. Not simplistic, but keep it simple. What does that mean? Don't estimate inputs you don't have to. If you can value a company with three years of inputs, don't do 10. If you can value it with 10 inputs, don't go do 50. If any of you worked in an investment bank as an intern, investment banking spreadsheets often have hundreds of inputs. You don't know who's running who. Are you running the model or is the model running you? Parsimony, that's what you're looking for. And if you've uh, you if you've gone to my if you go into my website and downloaded any of my valuations from Zomato all the way to ITC, the model looks exactly the same. And that's a message I'm going to deliver today: is you don't need different tools to value startups as opposed to mature companies. You just need imagination, and that's kind of tough for a lot of people. How many of you are recovering engineers? If I asked this in an IIM, the answer would be like 90%, right? The IIMB class that I went through had 101 people in it, 97 were recovering engineers. You know what engineers' biggest weakness is? They just don't trust their imagination anymore. Who can blame them? They've had a lifetime where they've been told, you know, if, if you let a creative thought pop up, it's a sign of weakness, bash it into the ground. So if you look at my valuation spreadsheets, I do have a different version for financial service companies. And if I get a chance, I'll talk about them. But for non-financial service companies, there are only five inputs, five inputs that I need to value the company. Ash Ashita, you have a question? Oh, no, okay. No, Kush, sorry. You, Kush, you have a question? Oh, no, okay. If you, have a, if you put your hand up, I will stop and you can ask me a question, but no. There are five inputs you need to value a company. You ready? This is the magic to valuation. First, you need revenue growth. Why it is the only honest measure of growth. How can a company grow its revenues? There are only two ways a company can grow its revenues. One is it sells more output or it raises prices, right? So revenue growth. The second is 
you can grow your revenues as much as you want. And this is a message that a lot of VCs and founders forgot over the last decade. But the end game in business is not to deliver big revenues. Ultimately, what do you have to do? You have to make money. I hate to have to remind founders of multi-billion dollar companies of this reality, but it's amazing how much this lo people lost their way. And how do we capture the profitability of a business? We capture it through profit margins, expected operating margins. You think, but I'm losing money today. I know, but tell me after you found your way back to steady state, what your margins will look like. So the measure of profitability in your business is captured with your operating margins. Why am I using operating as opposed to net margins? Because net margins can be affected by the debt you take and the games you play or other businesses you own. Operating margins reflect the profitability of your business. The third input I need to get to cash flows is I've got revenue growth that allows me to forecast revenues, expected margin that gives me operating profits. And after I net out taxes, I've got to subtract out what I need to reinvest. So I'm going to capture how much you reinvest by tying it either to revenues, if revenues are the driver, or if you have stable margins to your operating income. That's a reinvestment. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is that reinvestment going to be in a manufacturing company? It could be land, building, equipment, machinery. If you're a technology company, it's going to be R&D and acquisitions, but it's whatever you need to reinvest in to get future growth. But somebody's got their mic open so if you could just mute your mic just check your mic if it's if it's uh, if it's if it's live okay. so revenue growth operating margin reinvestment you give me those those three levers i've got your free cash flow right but you're saying where is capex where is depreciation where's working capital all of that is in my reinvestment everything you see as a line item in an investment banking spreadsheet is in one of those three inputs I'm just compressing them, those three. That Those give me cash flows. And I have two inputs for risk. One is the discount rate, your cost to capital. And again, don't get lost in the mechanics of cost to capital, of betas and risk free rates and risk premiums. I'm not saying they don't matter, but ultimately the output from all of that is a cost to capital. And here's the rule. Your cost to capital to reflect the riskiness of your operations. Risky businesses should have higher cost to capital. That's one measure of risk. You say, what's the other? When you discount free cash flows to firm at the cost of capital, it's one of those dirty little secrets of intrinsic valuation that nobody talks about. You're valuing your business as a going concern. You say, what does that even mean? You're assuming your company, but has a bad year, bounces back and comes back. Is that a safe assumption? Well, maybe for some companies, but do some companies not make it Absolutely. A traditional discounted cash flow valuation ignores that possibility. I know you've been told you can adjust discount rates, not for this kind of risk. This is what I call truncation risk. The risk that you will not make it. You cannot adjust a discount rate high enough to reflect truncation risk because it wasn't meant for that. So you know what you need to do? You need to estimate a risk your company will not make it. Now, this could be very low for an established company with, with, with a low, I mean, you take Asian paints, this failure risk is close to zero. But what, are we, what, what group of companies are going to try to value? Startups, right? What percentage of startups make it to year two? Anybody want to guess? One in three. One in three startups. Two thirds don't make it. Do you see where I'm going? If you just do a traditional DCF on a startup, even if you get every single number reasonably within bounds of where it should be, you will overvalue a startup. Why? Because you've ignored the possibility that your company will not make it. So you've got to bring in the failure risk. This is it. Young company, old company, company with intangibles, company with tangibles, it doesn't matter. These are the inputs that drive valuation. So as a first step, when you sit down to value a company, I want you to recognize why you're feeling uncomfortable. You know why you're feeling uncomfortable?
because you're just going to start to play God. And that should make any of us uncomfortable. If it doesn't, there's something wrong with you because you're surrounded by uncertainty, right? I'm going to sound like a therapist now, if you have therapy. But when you have uncertainty, one of the first rules is compartmentalize the uncertainty. Put it into bucket because it makes it, doesn't make it go away, it makes it more manageable. When you think about the uncertainty you face when you value a company or value a business, here are the ways you can categorize uncertainty. It can be estimation uncertainty or economic uncertainty. What's the difference? Estimation uncertainty is uncertainty you can reduce by going out and doing more research, collecting more data. Economic uncertainty is impervious to the work you do. And I have some really bad news for you. 90% of the uncertainty you face in valuing companies is economic uncertainty. Do you know what that also means, right? Doing more research is not going to make you feel more certain. It's just going to make you more uncertain because you realize what you don't know is actually vaster than what you know. So what should you do? Take the karmic pose. I mean, come on, as Indians, you're taught about karma. It's an extraordinarily powerful force in valuation. What does that mean? There are some uncertainties that you can do nothing about. You make your best estimate. And then you've got to be willing to move on. I'll give you an example. One of the biggest uncertainties in valuing Zomato is whether Indians culturally will be more inclined to eat out than they used to be. Let me repeat that again. To me, that's the biggest uncertainty in valuing Zomato. Because Indians historically have been less willing to eat out than the Chinese or the Europeans or the Americans. Why it might be a leftover from generations of, you know, being, I mean, my grandmother wouldn't, didn't eat out once, I think in her entire lifetime. Because to her, the idea of eating out first exposed you to germs and risks you could not control. And second, to food prepared in ways that she wasn't used to. I'm not saying that this is good or bad. It is there. But it's changing. I'm sure most of you eat out a lot more than I did when I was growing up because Indian you know, cultural habits are changing. But they will have to change a lot more for Zomato to be worth what we're pricing it at. You saying, what research can I do to make that go away? Nothing you can do can make that go away. You can make your best estimates and move on, but that's all you can do. Economic versus estimation uncertainty. Second, uncertainty can be micro or macro uncertainty. What's micro uncertainty? Uncertainty you feel about the managers, the company's products, the competition specific to the company. You spend a lot of time on that, right? What's a macro uncertainty? In the case of the Zomato valuation, one of the big macro uncertainties is Zomato would be worth a lot more as a company if India does well as an economy over the next two or three decades. Everybody agree? Because if you do well as an economy, per capita income goes up, per capita income. Let's face it, right now, 70%, maybe 60% of Indians cannot afford. Can you imagine being a farmer saying, I'm going to call a restaurant and order in food? You don't have the per capita income to be able to do that. Your capacity to eat out is going to be a function of economic growth in India. That's macro uncertainty. Inflation, interest rates. He's saying, why bother? Micro uncertainties. You make your best estimate. You come up with expected cash flows and then you let go. Macro uncertainties are the uncertainties you build into discount rates. Sounds odd. But can somebody give me the intuition as to why micro uncertainties are ignored when we value companies? Or should be ignored when we value publicly traded companies? Arjun? I think it could change in short term. It's very short term oh. in nature. So what is what, it's not it could be very long term right you have bad management that that underperforms or it takes terrible projects it could be so there's no short term or long term both micro and macro uncertainties can be short term or long term Surya 
I think it's more uh, perception based, you know. Uh, these are more based on perceptions, lack of data. And Let me ask you, so if I asked each of you what e Indian economic growth was going to be over the next three decades, you don't think perceptions play a part in that? Uh, no, not really. But Really? I'll wager you have huge divergences even within this group about what inflation yeah. is going to be. Perceptions are all over Predicted. the place with both micro yeah. and macro, right? Right. So... Adil? Uh, micro can be diversified away, Prof, but macro can be. Let's, let's pause a moment because Adil has hit the nail. This is your entire corporate finance class. And if you've been using betas without thinking about why you're using betas, I want you to listen for the next two or three minutes. Micro uncertainties are uncertainty specific to companies, right? What does that mean? Some of the managers you're betting on will do worse than expected. But if your expectations are set reasonably, what will some of the other managers do? Better than expected. Some of the products that your companies will introduce will do worse than expected. Some will do better than expected. You think, so what? You put all your money in Zomato? You're exposed to all the risks, right? But if you hold Zomato as part of a 30 or 40 or 50 stock portfolio. It's pure statistics. This isn't finance. It's a law of large numbers, right? If you have 40 companies in your portfolio and things happen that are individual, that are specific to individual companies across your portfolio, this isn't black magic. This is at the basis of portfolio theory and why we get away using betas is because we assume that not you, maybe, maybe not every investor is diversified, but the investors at the margin are diversified. Who are they? Mutual funds, BlackRock, foreign domestic institutional investors. You're saying, but I don't want to be diversified. That's your problem. Don't expect me to build in an expected return because you chose to put all your money in Asian paints or Reliance or whatever else. It is at the basis of how we estimate this country. Shres? Hi, Professor. Thank you for the opportunity for the question. Uh, just, uh, can you hear me? I hope you yep. can hear me. So uh, when you were saying, why don't we incorporate the uh, micro, uh, you know, risks, uh, which yep. uh, into the discount rate, I mean, my thought was, it's because it's idiosyncratic uh, to the particular firm uh, that you're evaluating. But that's just uh, a word, right? So why, but, idiosyncratic risk is risk but, as well, right? Right, right, but it affects but your suppose, earnings and cash flows. But the key word is idiosyncratic. What does idiosyncratic mean? It is specific, specific. to the company. But, it's at the basis for the diversification argument. Yeah, but wouldn't matter like you know uh, what the size of the economy is or what this is. Suppose like what you're valuing is a big like you know a uh, bank in America and it has the ability through its like you know actions to change the. Uh, discount rate because like you know it is uh, uh, larger than proportionate this, rate this, this therefore the that same, would be interlinked yeah. that's all this I was is the hubris ask. of thinking that anybody controls anything do you think JP Morgan has any more power over interest rates than you and I do I don't think so I think if, I mean, to the extent that you believe that a company can actually change the macro inputs, then we really don't have a company. We, we know we're talking about something far bigger. I don't think any company can change macro components. If it is that big, then you have a problem because you're looking at a company that's so much the economy that maybe you need to diversify outside that economy. Right, Because as investors in that country, then you need to diversify outside the country or you're going to all go down when the company goes down. I'll give you an example. Now, there was a time, I think in 2000, when Nokia, Nokia's market cap was 83% of the market cap of the Helsinki exchange. Nokia was Finland. So if you're a Finnish investor and you have your money in Finnish stocks, Guess what the world is going to look like if Nokia is in trouble? First, you lose your job. You probably work at Nokia, right? So you lose your job. Then you're going to see your portfolio melt down because Nokia getting into trouble means your stock is down. 
You check your pension fund, it's down because it's invested in Nokia. You're all going down with the ship when Nokia goes down. In 2000, Finnish investors had the least home bias in their portfolios. You know what home bias is? We all tend to overinvest in our domestic portfolios. Americans overinvest in, the, in US stocks. In, in, Indians, of course, are given no choice but to overinvest in Indian stocks. Finnish had the least home bias. That makes sense. So if you have a company that is that big a part of the economy, then you got to step back and define spreading your bets much more widely, or you really have trouble. You can't really, you know, you can't really think of that company as the entire economy. So here's the third grouping of risk. Risk can be continuous risk or discrete risk. Continuous risk is risk you're exposed to every moment of every day, right? So if you're an Indian company with, no, let's say if you're a US company with European operations, every time the Euro dollar exchange rate changes, your value changes, right? Why? Because your cash flows from your European operations are going to have a different value, higher or lower. That's continuous risk. There aren't that many countries left with fixed exchange rates anymore. But there used to be a time when, including India, used to have fixed exchange rates. Remember those days? Let's say you're a company with operations in a country with fixed exchange rates. As long as the exchange rate stays fixed, you're saying, I'm exposed to no risk, no risk, no risk, until one day you wake up and what used to happen in countries with fixed exchange rates? You had a devaluation or a revaluation. 70% off. That's discontinuous risk. I'll make a statement about finance in general and business more broadly. We become pretty good at dealing with continuous risk. We have derivatives, we have risk management tools designed for continuous risk. We're very bad at dealing with discontinuous risk. We just ignore it. We're in denial. You know, recently I was, um, I wrote my piece on country risk. In the middle of every year, I do an update on country risk. And I talked about the political system of a country playing out in risk premiums. This is all debate, and this debate that India has been at the center of, mm -hmm. as is it better for a business to invest in a democracy mm -hmm. or an authoritarian regime? Think like a business, right? Don't bring any moral judgments. What's a disadvantage for a business when it invests in a democracy? And you probably heard this from many companies investing in India. What are some of the complaints? Come on, you've never heard a company complain about India? What are some of the complaints? Raghav, have you heard any, anybody complain about doing business in India? Uh, I have. Uh, I think. Give, so give me, a, give me one. Uh, usually, I think investing in a democracy would be like everyone seems to have an opinion and it's. Uh, I, I, no, but I just, everyone doesn't count for you as a business, right? You're governed by yeah. rules and regulations and laws, and in a democracy, what can happen? Uh, rules can change, right? Change because the, the nature change. of a democracy is you elect a new government because, you know, new governments yeah. change laws. So, you know, that's the nature of democracy. Yeah. The rules keep changing. The regulations keep changing. You have, you know, populist movements against what you're doing. Then the government can bend and say, you know what, we're changing our mind. And com companies, I mean, in, for for I, as long as I've been listening to companies, they've been complaining, but not just foreign companies, but Indian companies. The rules keep changing, you know, why can't? And how, what has it led to? A lot of companies viewed investing in China as safer than investing in India for much of the last three decades. Okay? But there's a flip side. There's less continuous risk when you're in an authoritarian regime. Why? Because Beijing can promise you that the rules will not change for the next 30 years and they can deliver on that promise. Why? It's, there's no new government coming in, no elections they have to look at. But the problem with an authoritarian regime is you can have discontinuous risk. In Latin America, it used to take the form of regimes being overthrown. And when regimes get overthrown, guess who comes in? Somebody who so detests the previous regime that they're going to abandon every promise made by the previous regime, right? 
And even if regimes don't get overthrown, look at Beijing, right? Look at companies like, you know, forget about foreign companies. Take Chinese tech companies, Alibaba, Tencent. Five years ago, you know what the big pitch for those companies was? Beijing is on their side. Therefore, these companies, the, the sky is the limit. They can grow and do amazing things. And then all of a sudden, Beijing said, these companies are too big. We worry about control. They changed the rules. You're saying, but How we can they? try to, if it's unfair, we can go to court. Come on, in India, you can go to court and maybe challenge the government. But in China, what court are you going to, what domestic Chinese court is going to rule in your favor against Beijing? Continuous risk versus discontinuous risk. There's a fourth category here that I don't talk about. There's some risks which are existential risks. In fact, after I wrote the piece on um, country risk premium, somebody said, what if there's a nuclear war? I said, have you ever seen an apocalyptic movie where people talk about interest rates and stock prices? Because if there is an apocalypse, who cares what your portfolio looks like? You're just trying to survive, right? So if you're saying, what about climate change? What, no, to the degree that it affects your expected cash flows, bring it in, but then let it go. Because those, it's not that the risks don't exist, but if those risks play out, if there is a nuclear war, and if the, the world becomes too hot to live in, nothing in your valuation is going to save you. There are some risks you just need to let go. The reason I categorize these risks is when you think about valuing companies, the types of risks you face will depend on what, where in the life cycle your company falls. It's one of these, uh, if you watch my, my, my sessions, one of my favorite devices for thinking about companies is to think about where they fall in the life cycle. They call, startup is like a baby, a young company is like a toddler, and you have teenage companies. In 2019, I valued Tesla and I bought it. I described it as my corporate teenager. You know, I described it as my corporate teenager. Many of you look young enough to remember your teenage years. But what do teenagers around the world do? They get up every morning. They look in the mirror and they say, I have lots of potential. What can I do today to screw it all up? It's the nature of teenagers. The time horizon is like 15 seconds, right? When you, that's why you can read about this guy who gets into Harvard and then puts out a Facebook post with some awful stuff in it that leads to the Harvard offer getting retracted. And you say, what were you thinking? The problem is teenagers don't think. They're corporate teenagers. Then your company, the peak of their life. Everything they touch turns to gold. Then you become middle-aged, old age, and then you die as a company. You tell me where your company is in the life cycle. I can tell you what kinds of uncertainties you're going to face. With a startup, most of your uncertainties are going to be micro uncertainties, right? Most VCs are not sitting there worrying about the state of the economy. They're worrying about, will this founder be able to turn this idea into a business? More micro than macro. More economic than estimation, right? Because you don't even know whether the business model will work. And you know, the, the uncertainties are not going to be resolved by doing more research. And there's a lot of discrete risk at startups. A company might not make it. Things have to work out. And if you're a pharmaceutical company and you're looking at, you know, a, a young pharmaceutical company, you're working on a drug, working through the pipeline, there's discrete risk of will this drug get approved? If it doesn't, there's no company. So with that lead, and let's think about what it is about young companies that makes them so messy. Remember those four questions I said you need answers to? What are my cash flows to existing from existing assets? What's the value added or destroyed by growth? How risky is this company? When will you be a mature company? I want you to play the role of a, of a founder of a startup. Immense promise. And I'm going to ask you these questions. Ready? Each of you is an entrepreneur. You've founded a startup. Immense potential. You can do make the startup whatever you want to. So I'm going to ask you the questions. Ask you, what is... What are the cash flows from your existing assets? What's your answer going to be? 
what existing assets? I don't even own the chair I sit in. So that's easy. You have nothing to show. Then I ask you, what's your value from future growth? You say a lot. So can you be a little more specific? Not really, right? You have this great idea. You think it might work, but you don't know what the total market is going to look like, what your market share is. Then I ask you, how risky are you? You say, very. And can you be a little more specific? Not really. What can you show me? Past stock prices? You don't have any. No past earnings. And then I ask you, when will you become a mature company? You fall out of your chair laughing. You don't even know whether you have enough cash to make it through tomorrow. Now do you see why most people don't even try to value startups? By most people, I include most of the people who put money in these startups. A few years ago, I wrote a piece on VCs. If you get a chance, go to my blog and look for it. I said, VCs don't value companies. They price them. What does that mean? I come to you, I have 10 million users. I'm a, you know, I'm a subscription-based company. I have no, nothing to show. I have 10 million people who've signed up for this free platform. How do you price me? You look at what other people are paying per user, and then you multiply 10 million by that, and you say, hey, that's your pricing. You think that is very back of the envelope. That's what VCs do with startups. And I actually gave this talk to some Silicon Valley VCs, many of whom have been doing this for 30 years. And they said, I mean, if you're putting money in companies, why do you not value them? And they gave me two answers. One was the honest one, which is we don't care. We don't care about value because how do you make money as a VC? You buy at a low price, you sell at a high price. So if people are paying per user. What do you do? You buy my company based on the number of users I have. Then what do you do put pressure on me to do as a founder? What's going to be my focus? Pradyut? Growth. Growth in what? In, in, grow my number of customers, active users. I don't even care about your revenue. Just get me more users. Why? Because I plan to sell to somebody else. This becomes almost a Ponzi scheme, right? And you can see what happens as the end result is you build untenable business models with lots of users. Think Paytm. 330 million users, impressive, right? But how do they get 330 million users? By giving away crap for free. Anybody can build a business if you keep offering me 20 rupees off, 50 rupees off, 500 rupees off just to sign up, right? And that becomes the focus. It's unhealthy. It's not healthy for the company. It's not healthy for the economy. It's not healthy for investors. But that's what happens when people don't try to value businesses, is there's no interest in building a business. So when you look at, you know, we ask people, why do you not value companies? You get a whole range of excuses. First is, there's no past data. So what? But it shows you how reliant we become on financial modeling, right? Because if you're a financial modeler, not somebody who values companies, what do you do? You take last year's numbers, you make that your base year, and then you build off it, right? Based on historical growth and revenues. So if I take away that crutch, you're completely lost. An investment banking model without historical data becomes almost an unusable model because everything is based in the past. The second is, there's promise, but there's no clear business model. You know what I mean by business model, right? You have more users, and if I really am interested in value as a business, you know what I'm going to ask you. How do you plan to make money of these users? There are three ways you can make money of users. One is transaction-based. Ola makes money from you as a user when? I mean, I'm sure you have Ola apps or Uber apps on your phone. When, you know, having the app, you pay. I don't think, do you pay for the app? I don't. It's a, I have an Ola app on my phone. I, I use it only when I'm in India. It sits there, right? Until I have a right. This, it's transaction-based. The second is you can have a subscription-based model. I don't know how many of you have Netflix, but I'm sure quite a few of you do. You make money by paying a subscription. So you've got transaction-based, subscription-based. What's the third? How does Facebook make money on its, from its users? Advertisements. Advertising. 
It's interesting because when people talk about it, it's amazing how many founders are running to build these multi-million user platforms and ask them, how do you plan to make money they haven't even thought about how to do it? And that's a problem. How did the Paytm thought about how they plan to make money off their users? Because they were so busy building up numbers of users because that's what they were being priced at. The third is you say, but I don't know about these, you know, you don't say that about Asian paints or an ITC, right? About the managers. Why? Because these are companies that pretty much could run an autopilot. Ask yourself a question. In, the, in either of these companies, the CEO and top management doesn't show up for a month. Do you think anybody would notice? It's like this huge, you know, ocean liner, right? It's going to go where it's going to go. It's on autopilot. And I, I've told people, look, in I valued Royal Dutch in 2016, I used to ask people, you know, the CEO of Royal Dutch is. And they'd say, I don't know. And I'd say, I don't know either. And I don't care. Because what the heck is he going to do anyway? 96% of the variation in revenues in Royal Dutch comes from one variable, which is, so if you look at the variation in revenues over time at Royal Dutch, one variable explains 96% of the variation. It's an easy one. What do you think that variable is? Adil? Well, uh, actually, I had a question, Prof. <laughs> okay, I'll come back to you then. What do you think is the variable is that moves Royal Dutch? Revenues. Oil prices. Oil prices. And what the heck is the CEO going to do about oil prices anyway, right? Unless you're a Ramco CEO, in which case you could go to the Saudi Arabian government and say, guys, we'd like a higher oil price. Most of the other, you could have a, I mean, ChatGPT could run Royal Dutch and you wouldn't even notice. With young companies, though, founders matter, managers matter, because they can make catastrophically stupid decisions or the kind of decision that separates them from the pack. So you worry more about founders and managers. Adil, go ahead. Prof, you mentioned about Paytm building up 330 million <clears throat> users, right? But definitely they would have something in mind about how to monetize. Don't this assume so that. Don't assume that anything in their mind other than... than some, you'd be surprised at how empty the minds are of founders when they get focused on a variable. Everything else fades in. You'd assume that they think about business models. Don't assume that. So don't assume that just because somebody has built up a company that has a $10 billion or $50 billion value, that they thought about basic business questions because they've been, it's like Pav, have you heard of Pavlov, right? The Pavlovian dog response is if I keep rewarding you for having more users after a while, that's all you care about. So don't assume that there was this deep, deep plan in there of converting users because most of the time, in fact, 99% of the time, they build a user and say, now what? What do we do now? I call these bar mitzvah moments. If you're Jewish, you know, that's the time you grow up. These are the moments you say, well, I haven't thought about that yet. That tells me that you really are not a business. You're just a user machine. Mukund? I can't hear you. Mukin, the other question? Go ahead. Go yes, ahead. Prof. Uh, so it might be a very stupid question, uh, but I would still like to know your thoughts on this. So uh, given the fact that in the 21st century, like many of these businesses are platform businesses, digital first businesses, wherein they're not really making money. They're not focusing on the business fundamentals. As no, 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 no. Back up, back up, back up. Back up. Back up. Yeah. The bulk of the value hmm. of these platform, what, what are the 10 largest companies in the world? Yeah, Eight the of them are platform businesses, right? Yeah. None of them can be described as not making money. They're money machines. So let me give you the upside. To the degree that these platform businesses become winners, we live in a world of winner-take-all businesses. The old days, if you're an advertising company, you, you could be the very best advertising company. You were restricted by geography. You were restricted by reach you were never going to become 50% market share of all advertising. Now you have online advertising, right? 
Google and Facebook dominate the world. Why? Because they're not. So there are lots of platform companies, but don't tar them all. Some of the most profitable businesses in the world today are technology companies with immense platforms. Right. Are there businesses like Peloton and Zoom that have platforms that they have? Absolutely. But you can see why people keep trying, right? Because if you make it, it's like the payoff is immense. We've created essentially winner-take-all systems. So, you're going to, so this is going to be a feature, not a bug. People act like this is a This is not irrational. It's actually rational for VCs to throw money into them and say, if I get that big winner, I am the next Elon Musk. I'm the next Jeff Bezos. So be very clear about what else has changed in the 21st century. Businesses have become more winner-take-all businesses. And sometimes if you're on the right platform and you manage to get that to become the default platform, you won the game. Yeah. Um, I will, like, uh, just, to, just to continue my question, if I may. Yeah. Yeah, so my question is that, uh, do you think business fundamentals itself will change, wherein uh, maybe it, it really doesn't matter what your cash flow is? Yeah, uh, always, your... Whenever they're not changed, Mukunda. Mm -hmm. Name me one time in human history where business fundamentals haven't changed. The change that you can that you can predict, what do you do? You build into expected. So when I'm valuing healthcare companies in the US, I'm bringing margins down for even the most profitable healthcare companies, because I think healthcare in the US is facing an existential crisis where price pressures have built up to the point where things are starting to change. Governments are imposing price controls. So I'm gonna bring in, you know. So let's take it as a given. Everything is going to change all the time. Your job is to do what? Make your best estimate of how they will change, bring it into your cash flows. And that's all you can do, right? Are there changes that could happen that you did not anticipate? Absolutely. You value a hotel company in 2019. What were you worried about? What's what, Can I take market share from the next hotel? What will happen to the hotel business? What should What was the bigger issue that happened in 2020 that killed the hotel business? COVID. So if I take you up and say, in your 2019 valuation, how come you did not forecast and build in COVID? Then you either were part of a Chinese conspiracy to create COVID, or I'm being unfair, right? But here's where I will hold you accountable. Now that COVID has happened, when next hotel company that you value, what should you bring into your expectations? The likelihood that there will be future pandemics where you could have shutdowns for extended periods. We have to learn as we go along. So it's unfair for me to ask you why you didn't bring something into account, but it's fair for me to ask why, given what you've seen, aren't you adapting to those changes? Okay. Hi, Professor. Uh so I want to actually talk about WeWork. It was privately valued at forty-seven billion dollars, and of late. Wait, wait, wait. Let's pause right there. Privately priced at forty-seven. Price. Right? Price Who priced them? Billions. Who priced them at forty-seven? Uh, Who is the VC that priced them? SoftBank, if I'm not wrong. SoftBank. Who priced okay. them at thirty-six? That I'm I sure. think in seven of the ten rounds, SoftBank was the pricer. You see, the, this is like being on eBay and you keep outbidding yourself. It's a stupid game to play, right? You're the only bidder. SoftBank kept bidding it up. So first, I'm not sure that I trust that. Even as a pricing, I don't trust it that much because SoftBank is the one that's pricing it up. Second, what business is, I mean, if you wanted to encapsulate WeWork as a business, what do they do? I don't know whether they ever made it to Mumbai or Delhi, but I'm sure they did, right? Yeah. What, what's the what's core business? How does WeWork run? What does it's it do? Actually, a co-working space. But before you get the co-working space, what do they have to do? They Please. have to find a building, usually in prime commercial space, right? Every city that I've looked at, WeWork is usually in the most expensive part of the city, the, the 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 most expensive building they lease the building long term right 
And then what did they do? They subleased the building for three months, which, which is great for you as a startup. You want an office for the next three months or six months. You know the fundamental problem with this business model is? You ask anybody in real estate, what's the problem with this business model? You got a duration mismatch. You know what I mean by a duration mismatch, right? You're leasing long-term, you're subleasing short-term. You're saying, so what? In good times, you'll fill the building, right? But what happens during a recession? Everybody flees, but you still have to make your lease payments. You know why real estate has never been able to support this business model? Because of this duration mismatch. You think, but what about hotels? Hotels do the same thing. You know what, hotels, if they run well, should be pricing it based on occupancy, not at peak times, but at 60% occupancy, because you know there'll be bad times. We work fundamentally was a bad business model. So you think, how come SoftBank? No. And this is why I think hubris is the biggest enemy of investing, whether you're a VC or an investor. Who's the guy who runs SoftBank? Masasan, right? You know, he had a 300 year plan. Who makes 300 year plans? Really? This is hubris. Because you're, you're acting like God. You're saying, I'm a God. Look, I'll make a 300. And people called him a visionary. And my reaction was, the guy is insane. He might be a really smart guy, but it's gone to his head. It's Masasan. Who was the CEO of WeWork at the time they went public? You remember Adam, his name? Adam Newman. A guy called Adam Newman. This is the Adam. first company that was born out of a TED Talk. You know that Adam Newman gave a talk about the we so like 10 years ago and the whole concept of a man with an immense ego and an eccentric. I mean, he walked around, we work in bare feet and he demanded that people go vegan when they went. I mean, all kinds of things. Again, huge ego. I'd have loved to be a fly in the wall when Adam Newman and Master Son met. Two egos feeding off each other. You know, we think smart people don't do stupid things. The smartest people are capable of making the stupidest mistakes because they think they're so smart that the rules don't apply to them. When we work, filed for its IPO, you're right, it was priced at 47 billion. You know what Goldman valued it? And I'm going to put quotes around the word valued. You know what Goldman attached as a value to we work? 95 billion. He said, how did they come up with 95 billion? Here's the reasoning. Master Son is a smart man. If he paid 47 billion for WeWork, it should be worth at least twice as much. Let's build a discounted cash flow model and do some reverse engineering so we can come up with 95 billion. It's as, it's as absurd as that. And I valued WeWork and I was mystified. I mean, this was well before the IPO even fell apart. I came up, my best case value was like 8 billion. And that's stretching every rule. And I said, I don't see the basic business model here. I don't care if Master Son sees it and Goldman sees it. I just don't see it. And of course, eight weeks later, the IPO had been pulled. And then SoftBank essentially priced it back at, do you remember what it priced it back at? Like 8 billion. You know why they priced it back at 8 billion? They invested enough because they didn't want to write it down to zero right away. That's really the honest reason because they had a mark to market requirement at SoftBank. You can, I mean, some of the businesses that have gone public over the last decade, and these are multi billion dollar businesses, are businesses which have no business being businesses. They have no business model. I'm still struggling with ride sharing. Uber, Lyft, Ola, DD, Grab. None of them make money. When you're 14 years into a business and none of them makes money, you know what that tells you, right? Your business model is broken.
You know why the business model is broken? What is it about the ride sharing business that's made it so difficult to make money? I'll give you a clue, stickiness. You see, what? I have Uber and Lyft on my phone, both of them. I fly from San Diego where I live to Newark to teach during the spring. I take the red eye. I land in Newark airport at 5 a.m. I have to get a car, I have to get a car service to get to my apartment in New York City from New York airport. So when I land, guess which I use? What, I, what, what do you think I do when I land? Bridge. I check the Uber price because remember, you can enter the destination, it tells you the price. I check the Lyft price and every single time, and I do this 50 times a year or 30 times a year, guess which one I pick? The lower price one. I, I have no good loyalty to Uber or Lyft. What do I care? Often the same driver is driving for both services. And if you're a driver, you don't care either, right? This is a business. I'll leave you with that thought. If you build a business with no stickiness, it's very difficult to create a profitable business model. So you got to build stickiness, right? What are some of the things you can do as a, as a company to build up stickiness? Go ahead, Vishnu. So quick, quick question. Uh, Amazon was the pioneer of this whole loss making into decades and sort of set the template. So why is it so surprising that none of these companies are making it in 14 years? Let's give them another oh, 10 years. When you say none of these, what? They, Amazon was in 1997. Are you telling me there are no companies since 1997 that's found a way to make money? I mean, I can name at least a dozen. dozen. Some of them are the largest market cap companies in the world. Netflix, Facebook. In fact, you look at almost every other company, they came out post Amazon. So when you say none of these, that's not true, right? I mean, there are companies that have made it from losses. Sorry, I mean, uh, I was saying like, are these perhaps these ride share companies are modeling themselves on an Everybody Amazon? Everybody models yeah, themselves after Amazon. Modeling yourself doesn't make it so, right? You can, uh, it's, 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 so the question I ask is why do some of these companies succeed and why do others? And I think one of the things is stickiness. What, what makes um, the Netflix model sticky? Why do, you, why do you not want to cancel your Netflix subscription? It's content. You, they, they, they own the entire ecosystem and you so want to be on. So I was watching the show called Cora. Yeah, it's this new show. I mean, it's a big budget Indian. No. And if I'm in episode three and it's the end of the month and I'm thinking about canceling Netflix, I'm thinking, but I won't watch episodes four, five, and six, right? Why is it so difficult to, you know, to get out of, you know, Facebook? Because your entire life is on Facebook. You have no friends, let's face it, in the real world anymore. They're all on Facebook. You leave Facebook, you have no friends anymore. Let's face it, stickiness is the key here and the business that build in that's, I mean, why are we stuck with Microsoft? Your Office 365 subscription. You know how many Excel, Word and PowerPoint files I have on my computer? I've been using it since 1986. I'm terrified. I know there are other programs that claim you can convert things, but you know what those conversions always look like. Fonts get screwed up, especially in your older files. Good businesses find ways to create stickiness. Uber is trying. Lyft is trying. Right? One of the things Uber tried but gave up on was the subscription model. Subscription models tend to be stickier than transaction models. I know I'm, I'm, this is a tangent, but why do you think uh, a subscription model works for Netflix, but not for Uber? What is it about a user-based business that makes one model work and the other not? Vishnu, you want to try? Frequency of uh, usage. Or the, or the divergence across users, right? Some users, the top, I mean, and this is probably true at, at, at Uber, the top five or 10% of users account for 90% of the rights. So when you offer a subscription model, guess what happens? 
that top five or ten percent take on the subscription model, they pay a fixed subscription and get an immense payoff, right? Because they're taking 30 rides. You're left with the 90 percent that were taking like one ride a month, two rides a month, and they don't buy the subscription. Subscription models don't work when you have vast divergences across users. We need to be asking those questions about these user-based companies, right? And we haven't for a decade, and it's time we did. Shres? Uh, hi, Professor. So again, I completely uh, agree with some of the things you were saying about stickiness. If I could just take the example on the other end uh, for like software developing companies which create ecosystems for developers uh maybe uh like apple and the ios uh, ecosystem and the android ecosystem there the developers uh come to the platform and they're rather sticky because there's you know there's a, a specific way which, which part apps is sticky the, for the, the, the apple and the, and the google are sticky or the software is sticky the, the so software the, so like developing so the development that you require like to make a, an app for the apple yeah. platform but why is and like you know development right? that you the stickiness is on the customer side right so you make an app you put it on the app store why as a customer am i stuck with your app right so I would look at like developers as customers, uh, another stakeholder to the platform for both the platforms, because the more the apps but there are- Take there, the word stakeholder out. It's a useless word, right? Stakeholders, unless customer. you get paid money, you're paying money. It's just a word we use because I am affected, right? So forget the stakeholder part. You're a software developer. You're going to create an app for the app, for the app store. Why? Because you have no choice. You have to be on the platform. Or if I have a MacBook Pro, they don't let me download your app unless I go through all these, you know, these other steps. And Apple takes a slice of your revenues out. So I can see why Apple is sticky, right? Because I have an Apple operating system. I have to go through the app store. But what is it about your product that makes your product sticky? Because stickiness here is in terms of people buying your product and being stuck with that product, right? Essentially being right, willing so to- basically, yeah. the diversity of apps so in the sense of like maybe in a gaming platform, That's like, you know, Microsoft works against goes That's works against stickiness, right? You have diverse apps and there are multiple people offering apps for the same purpose. I have to pick you over those other people. Right? Now there are apps like, you know, the Adobe app, I'm not going away from because it's sticky. Why? Because they have you know, all these products tied together. I use Dreamweaver, I use InDesign. No, but most software apps I'm not sticking on. I have a text expand wrap. I'd replace with another text in the, in, 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 at the drop of a hat. I'll tell you the apps on which I'm sticky. I have Evernote. It's sticky because as I use it more, it actually learns more about me. So that's one way you can become sticky is you're using my past usage to make the app more attuned to me, which makes it less likely that I'm going to go to another app. So every software person that I know of is trying to find a way to make their product more sticky, but most of the time, it's really tough to do. Now in business, it's the same thing, right? Cisco and SAP don't always have the best products, but because they they've kind of entwined themselves into almost every part of your system. And I'd say the same thing about Infosys or TCS. It's very difficult for a company to switch from Infosys to TCS. It's not just saying, hey, who has the lowest cost? Stickiness is the name of the game. And finding ways to make your product more sticky has become how you separate yourself from everybody else. So think about it. I think it's a, you know, think about in the software space, the companies that have succeeded, the gaming space, the companies that have succeeded. And think about what it is that makes their product successful. And at the heart of it is there's some component of the product that makes it sticky, that makes their customers stay with them. Yeah. You have self-service? Who, who do you get self-service from? Geo? Uh, um, it's ultimately a commodity product, right? In a world where there was no stickiness, what would you do? You'd switch from cell service to cell. I have AT&T, right? I have no loyalty to AT&T. I'd switch to Verizon, I'd switch. 
So how do they create stickiness? They create models where you sign up for them, you sign a two-year contract and leaving it. So sometimes the con it, it becomes legal contracts you create to keep people tied to you because otherwise the commoditizing of your product will mean you call, the, the prices will get pushed down and you won't be able to make any money. Raghav? Hi, Prof. Uh, about the whole stickiness thing, like I think in the Netflix versus Uber debate, uh, also like what you said, like you were watching a particular show. Uh, so that really has that customizable thing to what it's delivering compared to Uber and Lyft. They both provide the exact same thing. Whereas like... Yeah. Uh, so you can't, I mean, unless Uber starts to show shows in the back of the car, you can't really take the Netflix. So the way you create stickiness has to be different in different businesses. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, in fact, one thing that Uber has tried is to learn because they know every ride you've taken with them, that they might learn enough about your movements that they can have a car ready for you at 515. If that's the time you come, you don't even have to call an Uber. It's built into the data. It's not that they're not trying. They know this is a problem now, but it took them a long time to recognize it because they were so distracted by, we just have to add more cities. We have to add more users that Nobody stopped and I mean, they would be a much healthier company now if in 2013 or 14, mm -hmm. somebody had stopped them and said, hey, you have a great model for growth. It's a low capital intensity model, but how do you plan to make your product or service sticky? Mm -hmm. Maybe they have designed the product differently grown differently and that's a problem with the new grow to 410 cities it becomes very difficult to fix a flawed business model right. so, uh, and that's why i think pushing founders to think about business models think about stickiness earlier in the process rather than later creates healthier companies uh, prof, to, to that question if i may ask uh, so there's also like the illusion of stickiness right like with something like social media apps uh, it's not necessarily like you need them, but uh, because you are an Instagram user and the networking effects start to play, it, it feels like you That's can't... That's a good question is, are we addicted to social media? There's a whole amount yeah. of psychological research that suggests otherwise, right? That this yeah. is an addiction for a lot of people. What's the definition of an addiction? How do tobacco companies create stickiness? They had an addictive product. They, they have an addictive product, right? And so let's face it, social media is an addiction. You might say you can live without it, but I'm not sure there are a lot of other people who might go exactly. with that. No? Uh, which is one reason when people turned on Facebook in 2008, remember the privacy scandal, which struck me as incredibly hypocritical. What is the entire scandal about? That Facebook was taking things they'd learned about you and using it to kind of fine-tune their advertising. Come on, this is their basic business model. Yeah. And who gave them all this private information about you? Oh, it was you. It is. So you shared intimate details of your life and now stop. And so that's why I bought Facebook. I said, this is hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. You know where the people complaining about Facebook were complaining? Mm -hmm. On the Facebook platform. So you're complaining about, and in the process of complaining about Facebook, they would tell you other aspects of their life. Say, I have an ulcer right now. Don't tell me things that I don't need to know. So the reality is that social media is, and this is why, you know, I think Elon Musk recognizes that he can do really incredibly weird things at Twitter and people complain about it. But guess what? They're still there. Right? So every six weeks, you hear about the, now that this is the end of Twitter. You know, this is, this is you know, removing the block feature will kill Twitter. Okay. Let's see. No. So let me, I, mean, I, I just a little while. Uh, how much time do I have left? It's late at night. I know it's after what, 1040 or so. Yeah, Professor, so gonna, have 15 I, minutes or so. Okay. So let me cut to the chase. You want to sit down to value young company, a startup. What's the first thing you need to do if you want to value it? If you want to price it, it's very easy, right? To price it, what do you need to do? You need to do look at what other people are paying for similar companies and the metric they're using. Number of users, number of downloads, and use it to price your company. If you really value a company, I'll play the role of the founder. 
Tell me what you don't have first. Relative to an established company, what do you not have? You don't have historical data. I could give you financial statements from my very young company, but there's nothing you're going to learn from it. I'll tell you what you're going to find. I have very little revenues. I'm losing a lot of money. Congratulations. Let's move on now. The first thing when you value young companies is to keep your eyes on the price. Revenue growth, your end game is to forecast those three inputs for your young company. So help me out. How are you going to project out revenues for a young startup, given that you have no history of growth or the, 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 you have a basic business model and a product, how do you go about, so what are the things you would need to look at to make your estimates of revenues? Are there? You can do start a similar business profit and you can probably look at a similar business model. They're all young, they're all start. So let's say you're looking at an AI company now. This is nothing Perhaps. you can learn by looking at other businesses. They all look like yours, right? They have no revenues. No, they're losing money. First, let's make it an AI business. What's the first thing you need to ask? How do I plan to make money on AI, right? Let's look at the different pathways. I could be making AI hardware. If you read my NVIDIA post from a couple of months ago, what did I do to value the AI hardware business at NVIDIA? I forecast out the expected size of the AI chip business because the very specific chip that NVIDIA, I forecast out a market share of that business and I came up with revenues, right? So it's AI. it could be AI software, in which case you're asking what's special about you. Everybody has an AI software business. You know, what is it? It could be AI based, you know, services, you know, consulting to businesses. So the first thing is you need to figure out how, so don't let anybody say, I'm an AI company. What the, I don't even know what that means. It was like the same reason I took issue when Facebook brought up the metaverse. I said, okay, I kind of understand the metaverse, but it tells me nothing. How do you plan to make money in the metaverse? Is it from transactions, from advertising? So the first thing is to force founders to say, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Don't let buzzwords drive them. Because unless they tell you what they plan to do as a business, you can't forecast out the total market for that business. Do you see what the difference here is? Rather than take history, I'm building from the top down. I'm starting with the total market and I'm building down and saying, this is the share of that market I can expect you to get. You see? That, that's all uncertain. Absolutely. Of course. But you think you're the only person who's uncertain about these things? When I valued Amazon for the first time in 1997, I made assumptions about how online retailing would evolve and how Amazon would dominate it and get a market share. I was uncertain about the numbers. But you know what? Jeff Bezos was probably just as uncertain. So don't put the onus of the world saying, I have to come up with you know, you know, predict good numbers here. You can do the best you can. So you start at the total. So with revenue growth, you often start with total market size. This is the basis for that buzzword that a lot of companies that went public in the last decade use called TAM. You know what TAM stands for? Total addressable market. Total addressable, total addressable market, market right? Why was that a big deal? Because your total address market is 5 trillion. They knew you're going to give a higher number to their company than if your total addressable market was 500 billion. So there was this gaming of the system. Let's make our total address. But if you're valuing the company, your job is to come up with a reasonable estimate of that total addressable market. And then you have to give your company a market share of that market. What goes into that? First, whether the business is a winner. <laughs> whether it's a winner-take-all business. I gave Zomato a 40% market share of the Indian restaurant delivery business. Why? Because food delivery, especially if it's through an app, is going to be a winner-take-all business. It's not going to be splinted across 30 users. It's going to end up with maybe Zomato, Zwiggy, and Amazon food or some combination this is not the kind of business where you're going to get, you're either going to be a winner. I am in my story, and this is a big part of it is you need a story. 
I see the Indian food delivery market growing. That's my total addressable market. And I see Zomato getting a 40% market share of that market. One of three big players. That gives me my revenues over time, right? Because then it becomes a question of getting from the number today to this. That's my revenue growth. It comes from looking at the business, looking at the market, giving market share. Let's turn to margins. Forget about everything else. If you're a founder and you want a high value for your company, you want a high margin or a low margin for your company? If I just let you pick a margin, would you pick a high number or a low number? You want to pick the a highest number you can, right? 70% margins, 90%. But you know what? You don't get to pick because that comes from the kind of business here, the unit economics, not a buzzword. But what does that mean when we talk about unit economics? What are we talking about? Ami, what does unit economics refer to? You're trying to find a way to unmute yourself? Manoj, what does unit economics refer to? No. Pratik, what does unit economics refer to? I think, you know, uh, margins per unit, like, you know, operating margins per unit. No, it's unit. too broad, right? It's what you make on the marginal unit that you sell, the next unit you sell. That's what unit economics is. So if you're a software company, let's say you go into Microsoft and you order a, a copy of Office 365. What do you think happens next? Do you think there's an elf in the Microsoft headquarters who runs around creating an Office 365 subscription for you? That would cost them absolutely nothing. The unit economics in the software business basically mean the extra unit you sell is almost all pure profit. What does it mean? The operating margin for software companies can be 40, 45, 50% because the unit economics work in your favor. But let's say you're valuing Bajaj Auto. What does Bajaj Auto have to do when they want to sell another car? They gotta make the damn car, right? And even if they're the most efficient manufacturer in the world, you're going to be lucky to have 15% or 20% operating margins because it costs you money to make it. You see where I'm going with this? If you have a startup that's going to make electric cars, its margins, operating margins, are going to be much lower than a startup that's going to create software. It doesn't make it better or worse. It's just different businesses. You heard of ARC? ARC is this, uh, this investment fund that invests Kathy Woods run. It's a you know, and they put out what they call evaluations, but they're almost laughably bad. And they value Tesla. And one of the things they will put out is in the last valuation of Tesla, they had, I think, 60% margins for Tesla. And I'm stupefied. How do you get 60% margins? What is Tesla going to become? A company that sells software to people with cars already? So when you think about margins, you can look at the business they're in, but then bring in unit economics. And when you think about reinvestment, define it broadly. Don't let accountants tell you what CapEx is because they're still bound by 20th century definitions of CapEx. R&D, customer acquisition costs, they're all reinvestment. So when you, <coughs> excuse me, when you try to forecast cash flows, Keep your, you know, keep it simple. Make it about revenue growth, margins, reinvestment, rather than building 50 line items because you're going to drive yourself crazy. And whatever you do, you're telling a story about the company. Be explicit about the story. What is the story you're telling about this company that allows you to estimate 80% revenue growth and 40% margins and very little reinvestment? Because you got to make that story explicit. This, the key to valuing young startups is learning to tell business stories and converting those business stories into inputs you can use to value companies. I mean, I don't know whether you've seen my book called Narrative and Numbers. You know, there's an Indian edition of the book, so you, know, I'm, you, you, you could check it out. 
So it's really about how to tell business stories that actually are tied to numbers. Because that's what you need to value young startups is be able to tell business stories. You say, what about discount rates? Don't worry about them. They're not even on my top 10 list. In fact, you know what I do at the start of every year? I create a histogram of cost of capital of all publicly traded companies from the 10th percentile to the 90th. I value young companies rather than go through beta, risk-free rates, risk premiums, which is a recipe for a nightmare. I go to the 90th percentile and say, look, it's a risky company. I'll give it a high cost of capital. And over time, as I make it a mature money-making company, I move that cost of capital down towards the median. This is not the hill you want to die on. Estimating betas for a startup or cost of debt for a startup or debt ratios, it's not worth the trouble. It's like an ever-shifting number. Focus on the numerator. And finally, bring in failure risk. If you have a very young startup, recognize the fact that 70% of the time, this company will not make it. As that startup moves through time, year one, year two, year three, its survival rates improve. As it gets more VC capital and gets priced higher, its survival rates improve even more. Why? Because you're sometimes too big to fail, right? Which is you get to 10 billion, 15, too many people will lose too much value if you go to zero. So if you need more capital, they will supply you. But there's no magic to this. It's not some you know mirror you look into and say, mirror, mirror on the wall, tell me what the growth will be in, you know, in the future. You got to be willing to craft stories. And what percent of the time are you going to be wrong? A hundred percent of the time. But here's what I want you to check. If you're just wrong, you should be wrong in both directions. Right? Some of your companies you should overvalue. Some of your if every company that you value. You're over the price. There's something wrong with the estimation process that you need to think about. If every company value is undervalued, again, something's wrong. That's bias. That's what happens when you get paid to do valuations. There's going to be bias. Mistakes I can live with because mistakes average out. Bias doesn't. So try to keep it out of the process. So that's my big message. I'm going to open up to any questions through your question. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor. Amazing session. Uh, could you expand a bit on uh, storytelling? I know it's subjective, but what makes a compelling young startup story for an investor or anything else on storytelling? So you are a potential investor in a, in a young startup. What makes... I, I suppose I'm a founder and pitching to an investor. What should I keep in mind? First, remember, you, the, for, let's start with the easy ones. Bigger your story the higher the price you get, right? So if you make a story about serving 5 billion or 50 billion or 500 billion, which is one reason founders like to tell big stories. Right. What's the downside of telling a really big story? You, have you to now that have to deliver on that story, right? So now you de describe yourself as a logistics company, not a ride-sharing company. You got to try delivery. You got You haven't even mastered your basic business of car service and you're delivering trying to deliver four or five other things so you've got to make this trade-off am i building a company that i just want to flip to the market at a higher price and be honest with yourself or am i building a company that i want to run as a business in the long term the reason i want you to be honest a lot of founders if you if you scratch the surface much as they like to talk about building businesses really want to cash out, right? They want to go to an IPO, they get the high price, they take their holdings out, they become rich people, they move on to another business. But if you really want to build a business, then you might have to turn down some venture capitalists. Do you see why? Because they're going to push you for more users. And you... So it becomes a question of what do you want out of the startup? Do you want to build a business for the long term that you're going to run or somebody is going to run that you... Or are you building something that you're that is a trade. It's like a trade. You're trading it to somebody else at a higher price because that's going to drive every decision you make. Right. Thank you. Anoj? Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor, I just have a doubt. Like, uh, what is the difference between unity economics and the ecosystem? 
so how they differ basically or Why they are, are you putting the two against each other what's one the ecosystem i determine no. unity economics but it's not unity economics or ecosystem right the ecosystem i don't even know what that means the ecosystem is the world you live in right is the world you live in effective unity economics of course it does right so i'm not sure yeah. what an ecosystem means other than um, everything happens around you is going to drive your 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 fundamental. No, in the products I'm asking, like for example, uh, right now the service providers they are trying extending their uh, business towards the uh, the TV uh, the satellite TV or you know subscription for the uh, Netflix. That's, a, that's, so no, they, that's your business model. So basically, that's what will drive you. You tell me what you're planning to do. And I'm going to work out the unity economics of what you're planning to do, right? So Go that's ahead. so it's not an either or. It's your description of the business. So I'm not going to give you unity economics. I'm going to extract it from what you tell me you're planning to do. Okay. Um, so if your mm -hmm. objective is, look, I'm just going to go sign up people because I want to become the largest you know, ecosystem out there so I can then do other things on this platform, which is a geo story, right? The geo story was yeah. never about we make money, but we're building a platform to do other platform. things, detailing, entertainment. Right. You know. Then the the unit economics are going to be off for mm -hmm. the, the telecom yeah. business because you're, you're yeah. charging people too little, right? Perfect. You might okay. be able to overcome it by saying these are the other things I can get out of that platform. Yes, you can help. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Pratik? Yeah, bro. Thank you so much. So my question is more, you know, macro level. So basically, you know, uh, the way you uh, showed the approach of, you know, valuing startup, like, you know, you gave the example correctly that, you know, how we work was you know, more valued, considering, you know, a lot of startups in India. How come, you know, do you feel that, you know, more of the startups are valued on the you know, upper side? And, you know, if yes, that is a feeling, then, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, results Can you I may take have the word valued out of that picture? This, the, every word time you said value, they're all priced. Right? Priced, yeah. What drives Correct. price? Mood and uh, momentum. The mood and momentum. No? Stories, but it's really mood and momentum. And the mood is good. Everybody right. listens to the story and they love the story. If mood is bad, I don't care how great your story is. Nobody listens to it. Right. So if mood and momentum is what drives pricing, what should you expect to see pricing do? Go all over the place. Uh, right. Zomato get get opens at, uh, at right. 70. Um, I'm sorry, as Zomato opens at 70, it goes to 150. It's no fundamental reason. The mood is right. The mood shifts, it goes to 40. Now it's back at what, 90. Okay. I, I get emailed every single time the price does something on Zomato saying, no, are you going to revisit it? I mean, look, my value is my value. There's nothing fundamental about Zomato that has shifted over the last two years that's going to make my value go from 40 to 150. You think what could make that happen? Well, if they were actually able to expand into grocery delivery and do it well and have 20% margins, that is a big expansion of the story. The reason I kind of held off on it is why, why is Zomato able to keep 20% of a restaurant? order because there's enough buffer built into the system restaurants if you look at the cost of their food relative to the price they charge for the food in the u.s it's about 30 percent to 40 percent of the cost so you can afford to give somebody 20 percent to deliver your food you know what operating margins for grocery stores is it's like five six percent eight percent maybe there's no way you're going to be able to charge 20% of grocery delivery because grocery companies would go bankrupt. Instacart, which was this company that Zoomed during COVID in the US, it's a company that delivered groceries. It's kind of crashed and burned precisely for this reason. They don't get 20% slices. They're struggling to make 2 or 3% slices. So if you get something that happens that makes your story bigger, then your value will go up. Nothing that Zomato has done in the last two years changes my core story. It doesn't mean my value is going to be, it might be 48 or 52, but it's not going to become 150. So the nature of these companies is pricing is the only thing driving them. And it's not just India, it's across the world, young companies, they're going to be all over the place. And I'm not going to sit and complain about that because it is what it is. But I don't have to partake. I'm not going to pick on other people who partake and say, you're crazy. You're... Well, what business is it of mine? It's not my money. 
You want to buy some art at 120? Go buy some art at 120. I'm not going to lecture you that you shouldn't be doing it. I've never believed in telling other people that they're wrong. We spend far too much time worrying about what other people do. Just focus on your decisions and let your judgments drive your decisions. Leave the rest of the world alone. Other? Sure. Uh, Prof, a very uh, basic question I had. When VCs are trying to price the companies and they push the prices up as much as po possible to lead it to an IPO. No, 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 wait, wait. You, can push, you can't push because, again, it's a pricing process. It's mood and momentum. Many VCs have down rounds. You know what happens when you have a down round? It's not that you want a down round, but the mood has shifted. So the last year and a half, you've seen a lot of down rounds in the U.S. because people have changed their mind. This is the risk in the VC business. You live by momentum, you die by momentum. So VCs don't get to keep set the price higher just because they want to. The mood is favorable. They're going to try to push the price up, but mood shift, momentum shifts. And that's what kills VCs is when that momentum shifts. Because then no matter what you would like to do, it's not in your control anymore. Isn't that a bad practice, Bob? It should be some kind of check and balances should be there and how they price these things. Do we think of Mark Cuban as an incredibly successful investor? No. Yeah. And a lot of people say, and you know what he based his, his reputation is built on, right? Not the Dallas Mavs, but he built a company called Broadcom, a broad, broad, broadcast.com. This was in the dot-com boom. And he sold it at the peak of the dot-com boom for five and a half billion dollars. It's a basis for his fortune. And then you know what happened? The company crashed and went yeah. bankrupt. If we judge Mark Cuban on the quality of the company he built, he's a terrible business person. But why is he viewed as a success? He got in on the ground floor. He got off on the 24th floor. That's how we judge VCs. You might not like it, but VCs are like traders in markets. You trade because not because you think value is there, but because you can buy at a low price. I, you know, I, and you can be a great trader. You can be, you know, and that's what separates the really good VCs from the average VCs is really good VCs can detect shifts in momentum and get out at the right time. I mean, I, you know, I think of Rakesh Junjunwala now, right? I mean, it's, I don't know the man, but, you know, clearly a person who had this reputation in these markets. You know what? He was a good trader. He was a trader at its heart. And the, the, the reason I think it succeeded was he didn't lie to himself about what made him succeed. It wasn't a deep understanding of businesses or cash flows or discount rates. The essence of trading is detecting shifts in momentum, getting in at the right time, getting out at the right time. And if you're a good VC and you can do it, who am I to complain about? how you made your money. Sagni? Yeah, uh, yeah. thank you uh, for the opportunity to have my question. Uh, I just wanted uh, to ask something offbeat uh, the topic. Uh, uh, it's about uh, end user financing. So uh, if a uh, startup is in the, the circular economy uh, domain, so uh what 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 should be the uh you know how should uh i gauge uh that particular startup to its particular business model like uh is it be a umbrella partnership can you be, model can, can you be, be, a little, be a little more explicit because in abstractions i don't know what you're where you're going so give me an example of a startup of something it's doing and then so, we can you're right Right, right, right. So suppose a uh, uh, agri tech startup is uh, you know developing a uh, 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 solar uh, pump, uh, okay. you know, uh, for the particularly small and marginal farmers. So how okay. how should that uh, CEO be defining or looking forward to implement a business model? Uh, like there are several, like uh, three or five of them, uh, right? So so what makes uh, this solar maybe a loan pump? based? No. Right. So, right. So, 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 first, so first, uh, first, let's look at it. Let's look at the issue. You got to get farmers to buy these solar pumps, right? Is that a slam dunk? Not necessarily. 
I mean, Indian farming is very, very driven by 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 status quo practices, getting a 70 year old farmer who lives in the middle of the farmlands in Punjab might not be as easy as you think. So that that so you know you have to first estimate what percentage of farmers are going to. Second, it's a solar pump, so clearly it's going to be better in some parts of the country than others. So you might have a regional concentration. Third. You know, solar pumps are solar pumps. There's nothing technologically special about what you're doing. The question you've got to ask is, let's suppose I start selling a lot of pumps in the UP. And what if another big company notices what I'm doing? Remember, there are people with deeper pockets. It's one of the questions you often have to ask startups is not, will you succeed? But what are your plans if success shows up? A lot of people say, what do you plan to do if you fail? Which is a stupid question. You're going to go out of business. The better question to ask is, what will happen if you succeed? You start to sell more pumps than you thought you would, and the competition arrives. What are you putting in place to fend off the competition? Those are the kinds of questions you need to ask the founder, because the founder says, I'll deal with that if I succeed. It's giving you the wrong answer. Because if you wait till you succeed and the competition comes in, then now what do I do? It's too late. So... The questions you're asking are the kinds of questions you, heard, you know. Is there an Indian version of Shark Tank? I think there is, right? Okay. It is probably. Yeah. yeah. Think of this like Shark Tank, right? Which is, think of the questions you get asked. You know, how do you plan to keep competitors out? You know, do you, you get legal protection against competition, a patent? Do you get, so those are the kinds of things that allow you to build a business model into your revenue growth margins and reinvestment and value the business. Thank you. But it's, it's about Thank asking you, the right questions. Dilip? Thank you, Professor, for taking the question. Uh, Professor, uh, my question is around the uh, valuation, and you mentioned that uh, we should consider the point uh, uh, where we have the data available and then rest leave it. Uh, we did an exercise in our no, no, class. No, 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 data, but you'll have no data. Mm -hmm. So you're oh, yeah. making your best estimates given everything you know about the business. So if you're waiting for the data to become available, you'll never get to a point where you can actually value the business, right? There is no data, except that is a reality. Right. You're building these estimates. It sounds like almost out of thin air, but based on your story, what you've learned about the overall business. So data is not even in the picture. It's your estimates. You make your best estimates given what you've learned about the business, the competition, the company. But then I said, you made your best estimates. That's all you can do. Move on. Don't beat yourself up and say, how do I know I'm right? Because I'll save you the trouble. You're definitely wrong, but so is everybody else looking at this company. Just be ready to move on once you made the estimates. Right. And uh, if uh, I just take, want to take an example yeah. of uh, uh, Indigo, we did uh, yeah. the pricing, I would say. Uh, which currently seems really overvalued, uh, but uh, if I have to... Really... Overpriced. So basically, that's a market price. Don't even let that enter the process, right? That's got nothing to do with you. That's what demand and supply is. Your job when you value Indigo is not keep looking at the market price and say, how do I get close to that? Okay. It's to build up a business model for Indigo. And with Indigo, you have a core problem which is going to get in the way of giving them a high value, which is they're an airline. Name me one airline in the world where you look at the camera and say, I wish I had a business model like that one. It's a horrible business. It's one of the worst business in the world to be in. What makes it a horrible business? Revenue growth is tough. It's an incredibly competitive business, right? You got to cut prices. Margins are abysmal yeah. because you got fuel costs, you got staff costs. Reinvestment is huge, right? Because you got to buy those damn aircraft. And you add on top of that the fact that you're leasing the aircraft and you're probably all over level. This is a horrifically bad business. So if you're trying to sell me an airline, your, your, your barriers to, to making that sale are already high because I'm going to ask you what's special here. How after 50 years of trying and failing have you found an airline that actually has broken the mold? Only like two or three airlines in the last 50 years that have separated themselves. In fact, only one, Southwest, when it came out, because it broke the mold by going with this discount airline model where you didn't fly from big name airport to big name airport, kept costs low. 
but the Southwest model has kind of run its course, right? It's now imitated every lot of discount airlines. Now I find I'd find it very difficult to justify buying an airline unless the price dropped to a dramatically low level. Um, so I own Southwest, but I bought it in during the peak of the COVID crisis when the stock had dropped. And same thing with Singapore Air. But the value is not didn't go up. It's the price dropped enough for me to justify it. So I, I think Prof, the lips question would be the last one. I think we've taken a lot of your time, Professor. Um, I would like to thank you, Professor, for your uh, knowledge that you've shared with us today. I'm sure it's enlightened all of us. Thank you so much for taking time out. And, you know, we've, we've gone past one and a half hours. Uh, it's been a privilege for all of us. And uh, we hope to see you sometime at ISB soon. Uh, and, and thank you from all of us here, Professor. Thank you. You have a great day. And uh, I hope you're safe and your friends and family are safe as well in California. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thank if you guys, all. if you guys have any questions, you know how to find me. I'm easily findable. So, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Take thank care. You. Bye bye. Thank you.